Night in the Woods had been on my list of need-to-play games since it came out in 2017. Since then, I've heard many times how insightful, clever, and touching it is. I just finished it about a week ago, and I have to agree. It's a great-looking, great-sounding game with a fun world design and a soundtrack full of really catchy, original songs. Night in the Woods makes itself a one-of-a-kind experience through its design and its clever dialogue, but what has really set Night in the Woods apart and kept it at the center of a lot of conversations about game writing even years after its release is the way that it makes players feel, which is due in large part to how the characters are written and how they can interact, creating a meaningful and emotionally challenging story. As a screen therapy game review, I'll be looking at how Night in the Woods affects players psychologically, emotionally, and even how playing this game can strengthen some important emotional skills and provide potentially healing new perspectives. Fun design and music aside, the real heart of Night in the Woods gameplay and story are its exceptionally realistic and down-to-earth characters. I don't think I've ever encountered characters in a game that struggle with such relatable problems surrounding life, education, career, finances, mental health, relationships, friendships, and the nightmare roller coaster of tackling adulthood milestones, failing to, and then dealing with the opinions of others in the aftermath. We play as the character May just as she's returning home to her small, decaying Rust Belt town after dropping out of college. Although May always feels a little disconnected from others, through her, we reconnect with friends and acquaintances. She learns throughout the game, as long as we play it patiently and curiously, more about her friends and other townspeople. And in return, we as players learn more about May. May feels like a real person, someone fully fleshed out. You play as her, but she's very much her own person. You can get some wiggle room with the dialogue options, but she will stay true to herself even if you wish you had another choice. The rest of the cast feel just as real. B, Greg, Angus, and the rest of the town feel like people plucked directly from real life. They're struggling with jobs, money, family, and finding purpose. When running around every day to interact with them, it doesn't feel like talking to a computer like an Animal Crossing. Sorry, Animal Crossing. It feels almost like a real conversation. Because of all this, it's very easy to identify with a little bit of all the characters. One of the reasons we enjoy these relatable characters is because, as according to social cognitive theory, we're learning through them. By guiding Mei through her story and learning more about the other characters, we're also learning new ways to tackle similar, difficult situations. We're learning the importance of friendship and communication. We're being reassured that we aren't alone in our anxieties and feelings of inadequacy. And we aren't so special to be singled out by the universe to suffer setbacks or negative events in our life that are just unique to us. We rediscover just how normal our problems are by seeing these characters go through them too. We may have also had to cope with the emotional whiplash of living life one way and then needing to make drastic changes that ended up making us feel a little left behind or unimpressive. Seeing others struggle as we do, and to accept the validity of their pain, opens our minds to accepting the validity of our own pain. An important realization for us to practice the always needed skill of self-compassion. This game also raises awareness of how mental illness can show itself in our lives. Although May didn't have a diagnosis, we learn about her past and her episodes of intense disconnection and panic, where she describes losing her associations for people and objects, until they become what she calls dead shapes, meaningless forms. It might be irresponsible to diagnose a character without full context, but many believe she struggled with depersonalization symptoms. Depersonalization or derealization disorder occurs when you persistently or repeatedly have the feeling that you're observing yourself from outside your body or you have a sense that the things around you aren't real or both. We hear from May just how upsetting and disturbing these episodes were for her and it really sounds similar to what she describes going through leading up to her attacking the boy in high school during one of her episodes. And she also experienced another one of these episodes while at college when presumably the stress of the new place and responsibilities might have mounted to a peak. She came home with wounded pride, but she was acting out of self-preservation. She needed to heal and return to the comfort of familiar places and people, though we see nothing was quite the same when she got back to Possum Springs, and that's another layer of May's journey. 
From all this, we learn that just because others see May as a college dropout, as someone lagging behind or to be pitied, we learn that May was doing something she needed to do in order to take care of herself. Something more remarkable is how May is in the unfortunate position to have to reinvent the wheel for herself in terms of finding coping strategies. The only person in her life who could help her discover her needs for strengthening her mental health due to very real problems of having limited number of healthcare professionals in small towns seemed to be a doctor slash dentist working outside of his scope and couldn't offer her the complete help she needed either. May, in a state of limbo in society, in her life, and in her access to behavioral health resources, is a deeply sympathetic character, someone who, relatably, seems to have fallen through the cracks of society and into a blind spot we hardly ever talk about or place at the center of any of our stories. And she is a character that perfectly encapsulated the pain, awkwardness, and confusion of someone battling mental health concerns and mounting existential dread more or less on her own, the way many players may empathize with. In light of all this, although some might want to label May as a college dropout bum, we can see that throughout her story she's working incredibly hard to keep herself and her ideas of home and friendships and a meaningful life together. In fact, I consider May as a character to be a great victory for game writing in general. May's not the kind of person who ever gets the spotlight. Characters like her are usually NPCs on the outskirts of someone else's story, ignored or mocked while heroes and heroines move around her to get to their goal. Throughout the game, May's often arguing with people to assert that she's an adult and should be respected, always feeling left behind and unseen. And we can all relate to that time in our lives when we're transitioning into adulthood, but with little in our lives to recommend us as being truly grown up yet. Bringing someone so unseen and unexplored to the center of a story, especially a video game, and giving players a fully compassionate view of her life and worries is incredibly helpful. We need atypical and awkward characters like May so that we can learn from them how to be compassionate for the atypical and awkward parts of ourselves. This element is also woven so expertly into her relationship with her friends. After all, it is because May is in such a vulnerable state that her friends eventually open up to her about their deepest fears and their childhood traumas. For example, her conversation with Angus while they were stargazing will always be very special to me. To me, it's a shining example of exactly what video games can do for us if writers are courageous and open, and if players play patiently, mindfully, and respectfully. When we're May, we relate to her and want to help her solve her emotional struggles, and as May, we also learn from her friends about how they've coped with their own pain or how they're currently coping. We help her act out open communication about mental health and emotional needs. We help her take small steps to feel better, including some recommended coping strategies such as keeping a journal, talking to loved ones about our feelings, socializing, engaging in creative hobbies, and we even experience with her how to reaffirm our values and how to get more comfortable with accepting the unknown. By caring for May, we are practicing to care for the parts of ourselves that might, maybe for some players against their wishes, remind us of her. Or we are learning to be compassionate towards those in our lives who remind us of her. Keeping this compassion and understanding with us as we resurface from the game and into our own lives again can only benefit our inter- and interpersonal relationships. The Benefits of a Balance of Hedonic and Eudaimonic Something that's very helpful about Night in the Woods is the fact that it's one of the rare pieces of media that seems to be a great balance of hedonic and eudaimonic themes. To recap these ideas that I've discussed in my other videos, all media fits on this spectrum. Hedonic media is light-hearted, cheerful media that helps us relax, laugh, and recover from stress. Eudaimonic media is emotionally and psychologically complex, with lots of layers to chew. It could be tragic or thrilling or dramatic, but the most important element is its ability to help us learn and to create meaning out of stories. It can even help us grow psychologically. Night in the Woods is full of quirky humor, clever dialogue, and funny or heartwarming moments. Its design and catchy songs all lend itself to hedonic valence. However, as the story progresses and we get closer to the core of what May has been experiencing emotionally, and as we trigger events that create moments of conflict or vulnerability with her friends, we're transported into distinctly eudaimonic territory. When a piece of media lies somewhere in the middle of the spectrum like this, we can get the benefits of both sides. 
Playing Night in the Woods can be relaxing and healing for our stress, but also give us important perspectives and meaning-making opportunities that bolsters our emotional resilience for the future. In the end, if you've played this game, you might hesitate when summarizing it. It's about May returning home and acting out her daily life in a small town. And it's about May uncovering a supernatural plot in the underbelly of Possum Springs, sure, but that doesn't feel like the journey we really went on. Instead, we might better summarize this game as the coming-of-age story of a young woman battling personal demons, reconnecting with her past, and at the end, toppling a figurative Lovecraftian horror of pure, unbridled existential terror. Which brings me to my next point. The true story of this game to me is about battling an invisible but ever-present existential dread. An existential crisis, or existential anxiety, refers to feelings of unease about meaning, choice, and freedom in life. It's all about the concerns that life is inherently pointless or that our existence has no meaning because there are limits or boundaries on it, and that we all must die someday. Existential anxiety and dread tends to come up during transitions, and often signifies difficulty adapting, often related to losing safety and security. Existential crises, dread and anxiety, or depression can all be brought on by one or more major life events, such as the loss of a loved one like May losing her grandfather, dropping out of college, or even just entering a significant new stage of life like turning 20. In my opinion, it's one of the most invasive and deeply terrifying anxieties a person can experience, because there are no answers we can quickly grab onto and the anxiety is fed by not having the answers. We see peeks into May's internal dialogue about life, meaning, spirituality, and hope. The majority of the time, May seems to be teetering between wanting to believe there's a purpose or a bigger picture for her life, which has taken a sharp turn when she left college and with her mental health concerns mounting, and adopting a deterministic or even nihilistic perspective on life. It isn't until the end that we see May makes her decision. And the ending was jarring for a lot of players. After spending many hours investing in a story that felt mostly realistic, with characters that feel like real people, we're shifted into a reality where there are underground cults sacrificing the underprivileged to a devil-like telepathic beast called the Black Goat living in the mines that can grant minions special powers. I got a kind of emotional and cognitive whiplash when I got to the end. I didn't know at first how to reconcile the story up to that point with the sudden, terrifying mythos being confirmed and confronted right at the end. But what perhaps ties both the supernatural ending and the realistic story of character growth during the first several hours of gameplay together is the theme of existential anxiety. The black goat, the creature the cultists are feeding, in return for its promises to revive Possum Springs to its previous glory as a bustling mining town, the creature that had been whispering to May and troubling her dreams, feels like a representation of a dangerous belief that nothing has meaning or value over self-interest, a greedy abandonment of trying to find meaning in others, or something bigger than oneself or one's wants. And the black goat sits opposite from the cat god creature May encounters in her dreams, a cosmic being indifferent to the people who pray to it, bored of mortals and even confused as to why it's seen as a god, and it even leaves her and the rest of the world behind during her dream. Towards the end, May is stuck between the greedy whispers of the black goat and the abandonment of the neutral cat god, neither giving her satisfying answers about the meaning of her life. Instead of trying to wrap our heads around the lore of this world and who or what the goat and cat are, Instead, we can see that these two entities can serve as symbols of what existential terror feels like. Those struggling with existential anxiety can struggle with traditional religion and how indifferent gods and deities seem to those who suffer. It can be difficult to reconcile a benevolent higher power with what might seem to be meaningless suffering, and they can run in horror from the greed and almost ritualistic sacrifices larger institutions and societies engage in for the sake of getting what they want in life, which is usually money and comfort and fame, forsaking deeper meaning and relationships. May's journey out of her existential anxiety is defined by her decision to worship neither the black goat or the cat god. She learns how to make her own meaning in life. She chose to believe in neither of them, but to believe in herself. In her final confrontation with the Black Goat, I'd like to think that the reason the Black Goat spared May was because it really didn't have any power over her to begin with. She wasn't like the others. She wasn't latching onto the past anymore. The others saw no meaning in the future if it wasn't going to look like the past. 
May had decided in that moment that she wanted a future, no matter what it looked like, and she was going to cherish it. She was going to create her own meaning for it. She didn't need or want anything the black goat or anyone else could tempt her with. With this in mind, the story to me seems to be about the struggle between self, well-being, and growing into a world or even a universe that feels unsympathetic to us, and carving out an idea of what makes our life meaningful among the rubble of the past and the anxieties about the future. And although the story may close with only the half-hopeful, take it a day at a time, the world sucks but at least we can enjoy today, slightly nihilistic worldview, this can be just what some players need. Now I personally feel a bit differently about my life and place in the universe, and the closing dialogue of the game seemed to me to only scratch the surface of what a meaningful life can hold. But I understand that the reason the ending didn't quite reach me with its message was because it wasn't really meant for me. And that's okay. This story has and will continue to help many people who are caught between their own cat gods and black goats. There was a time when I was stuck too, a time when I was dizzy with existential terror, and so I can remember that and see how useful this story would have been to me then. So if we return to social cognitive theory, this game is a wonderful learning tool for those who feel as May does, and I bet can even help them learn how to lift some of their own existential anxiety from their shoulders. And at the very least, if we identify with May in any way, then seeing her overcome these trials can be a great source of comfort and reassurance that we're not as alone or as strange in our anxieties about the universe that we thought we were. And if we can't do anything else, at least we can believe in ourselves. Making Hope Regardless of my personal experiences or worldviews, I deeply appreciated what Night in the Woods does for its players. I really respect the heavy weight the writers lifted. Only a few rare narratives, and even fewer video games, attempt to show players how someone like Mei, a very atypical lead character, can find hope and the resources for starting her journey to self-actualization even in the darkest of places, literally and figuratively. They tried to provide a light at the end of the tunnel for those struggling with their mental health or with existential dread, or for those feeling displaced in the world changing around them. And at the end of May's story, it does feel like we're coming out the other side of that tunnel with a flickering hope for the future, an appreciation for the present moment, and the resolve to not wait for meaning to be given to us, but to create meaning for ourselves in the little things, the stories we write, the time we spend with loved ones, and then the effort we put into building our lives. And just like that, this game, like some of the best eudaimonic media out there, has given us a tool to use in order to practice making meaning in our lives and boosting our general sense of well-being. It's an ending with small comforts, but some of us just need a little comfort as a kicking off point to create more for ourselves in our real lives. Thank you for watching. Sometimes I struggle to get all my ideas out here on my screen therapy channel, but recently I was interviewed by Ken Gagne of the Polygamer podcast. If you liked any of the ideas covered here or in my other videos, I really suggest giving it a listen as I get to go into much more detail. The link will be in the description below. If you'd like to see more videos about the intersection of media psychology and well-being, please go ahead and subscribe. And as always, happy playing.